Hello, and welcome to Spectrum Theater Ensemble's Neurodiversity New Play Festival. And so I want to uh, introduce Mashuk Mashtak Dean's 10-minute play process panel. Uh, essentially, we're talking about the themes for uh, this year's festival that was to go on full force before everything. I'm so happy that you're here with us today. Thank you. Uh, what was your original goal for this uh, piece and, and this process? And what were you hoping to, to get out of it? Sure. Um, my original, I'm, I'm really interested in generational differences in my work at this point in my life and being in my mid 40s. And so I was particularly interested in looking at aging and uh, thinking about how am I and how are we meeting neurodiversity, but specifically around this idea of aging. And so I wanted to know what was the same and what was maybe different, um, depending on if you were uh, neurodiverse or not. And I think one of the things that I, I found confusing and then enlightening was that I couldn't really see very much different. <laughs> um, I kept trying to figure out how is it going to be different and as we kept talking over the days I just felt like we were five or six people talking about aging just like any other five or six people talking about aging and we all had our individual journeys or baggages or things we brought to it but there wasn't any it's like this if you're this kind of person and you're like this if you're that kind of person and um, that was something I, I didn't know that I was going to discover. Uh, yeah, totally. Um, and obviously taking into account the pandemic and the seismic shifts of uh, our culture right now, uh, what did you discover in this process? You did mention that you discovered aging is aging, regardless of where you are on the spectrum or not. Um, yeah. But uh, other things you may have discovered in this process, in this medium, uh, and like what challenges did that pose? It was really challenging for me. Um, I am a live theater maker and I'm used to developing work in person and so it was a huge learning curve to be spending three days over multiple hours on this Zoom format with uh, these folks and um, I really felt um, A, I had a lot to learn and I had to learn on my feet. Um, there were things about being in person that we just could not have together on this video format, the conversations we might have while we're on break or having snacks or the jokes that might pass across the room as we're talking about something. Zoom is a very focused format and sometimes what we want is not to be that focused but to be playing in an area and seeing what comes up. And I think there is something that is um, intangible and a little ineffable about just being in the room together and the energy and the shared space um, that creates bonds with us, that uh, creates a different kind of trust so you can go to different places, um, that it's just like an energy thing that is hard to explain but forms the bedrock or the foundation of the piece you'll then make uh, with people. And I couldn't find that, I mean, little bits of it, but I couldn't find it in the same way. And so I found myself very much missing being in a room with uh, all of the people here on the screen and that though we had done some work together there was a piece of work that just couldn't be done because we were not in the same room totally um uh, i i, I want to move down uh, jim you are, you are a providence actor that has been around for quite a while um and you uh, were with us uh, in hotel plays uh and so you've worked with spectrum before um how is this, uh, you know, in, in general too, as an artist, um, you know, how are you facing these differences? How has being around for a while with your experience and aging, you know, uh, how has that um, changed and how do you feel this was addressed in that process, if that makes sense? Uh, it does, it does. Um, it's, it's been difficult. It's, um, um, the Zoom format. I, I love theater, I think, as all of us all of us do here. Uh, as Dean was saying, uh, being in the same room, that community, we've worked on plays together, uh, Teddy. Teddy uh, it's, it's just not the same. I feel isolated here, and yeah. I do feel like I'm in this little box. Uh, but it's, uh, it's better than, as Dan said earlier, uh, it's definitely better than nothing at all. Um, 
I'm taking a class on Zoom now. I am doing a Providence Fringe Festival, uh, which I believe a lot of people in this group are. Yes. So that's what been interesting, rehearsing and uh, preparing that. And uh, um, I just, uh, I'm looking forward to the day that we don't need to do this. The aging, uh, I just had a birthday along with Dan. Uh, we're both cancerians or whatever. Uh, David, you, you mentioned other things that you're, you're working on right now um, during this kind of period of isolation. Um, and if you could talk on that, uh, of like, you know, how you're trying to continue your artistry uh, in this kind of format. And then also secondly, you know, how have you found uh, anything you've discovered in this discussion uh, in these rehearsal rooms or these Zoom rooms, um, just about, you know, your identity as someone on the spectrum who's an older gentleman? Well, well, for, well. First of all, I think one of the reasons I've been writing so much is 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 a by byproduct of the isolation because I miss the live theater so much and the live process, the, the in person process. And I'm basically having more and more conversations with myself, which is you know part of my writing process anyway, because you know there's this there's this need for social contact, and if I if I can't be with the people, I'm gonna have to create them. So. That's what that's that's what I found, um, and and our need to use formats like this just to maintain our visibility. Uh, yeah, it's it's I feel it's I feel it's a duty, duty and responsibility, and also to, we keep, need to always be prepared to be in shape. This about uh, about the aging process being being part of the spectrum. It's. Um, well, 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 well Dean, Dean is probably right, uh, almost certainly right, that aging does seem to be a universal experience. There are aspects of it in that because, because just like, just like gay, gay, gay people, a uh, gay novelist uh, who were older, and he was saying, the problem with my generation is our older generation was wiped out by, by a pandemic. And so we didn't have role models on how to grow old ourselves as, as gay men. Mm. And I think that may be similar because because autism and the spectrum are still a relatively recent phenomenon. I mean, I, I don't think they, I don't know if it's there, there have been test subjects until now of how to observe the differences, the possible mm. differences between people in the spectrum and the general, in the general population. I mean, in some ways, because navig navigating this condition requires constant self observation. Maybe it's an advantage. Yeah. Maybe it's maybe it's an advantage for people on the spectrum because they have to constantly observe themselves and you know people. So maybe we're better prepared in the general population. I don't know, but we'll see. Well, that, that's, that's very that's an interesting observation, um, Dan. I know I know your your story, uh, and you were uh, you know diagnosed at a young age with a myriad of sure. different challenges. Um, yeah. And, uh, and, and just actually going back to Dean's idea of his interest of uh, generational differences. Mm. Uh, you've been kind of a, a part of the community for about at least 25 years or so now. 25, 30 years, yeah. Um, how have you seen it change in that time? Uh, and going back to what David was saying, like there doesn't seem to be uh, an example for, uh, for all of you of like what it is to grow old on the spectrum if there is right. really that big a difference, but there, there doesn't seem to be an example. But, um, but it also seems the perception of what autism is and, and what that means has changed. Yeah. Uh, I just don't know if you had any thoughts about that. Yeah, absolutely, um, yeah. So, so, I mean, I was, I was one of the first group of children to be diagnosed with autism in the state of Rhode Island as children. Um, I mean, I, most of the other children in that group were either a lot younger than me or they were like almost adults. So I was kind of in a very unique position as a preteen being diagnosed. Um, and as you said, I mean, you know, so many people are diagnosed as adults because, you know, they, there wasn't any diagnosis when, for most people when they were kids. So I mean, we, we have, you know, even though there are many adults with autism, there have been probably for eons, 
no one's ever really known what the difference was. So we, we don't have any knowledge. We don't have any experience. We're literally, we're literally learning everything as we go. And I mean, you know, I, I had a, I had a childhood that was interesting, you know, there were good parts, there were bad parts. Um, my early twenties were absolutely were a nightmare, but it got better, it got better. And even though we're having the issues we are in the world today that are kind of almost setting me back a little bit currently, I had that experience of my early 20s to look at and say, I don't want to go certain places. I want to avoid that. I want to keep growing. And I am looking forward. You know, I, 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 like, uh, like Jim said, I just had my birthday a couple of days ago. I turned 39. I'm a year away from the big 4-0, but I'm looking forward to seeing what's ahead. Mm. That's lovely, Dan. I like that. Uh, Jay, you are a prominent, uh, prominent spoken word artist in our community. You are a great actor. You joined us on Cuckoo's Nest. You're my chief and forever will be. Uh, uh, you, you're also, you're an older artist who's been around for a little while. And uh, you were just recently figured out you're on the spectrum. Yeah. Uh, and so, and so this was probably the, I just, I'm, I'm curious of your perspective in coming into a room to talk about aging, having just kind of learned some of this knowledge about yourself. Well, that's uh, an interesting question. It, it definitely gives me some perspective on a lot of different things that have happened in my life. A lot of different uh, miscommunications, let's mm. put it that way. And uh, I don't know, I guess it kind of makes it a little easier to deal with some of the stuff from the past, knowing where it's come from. Um, when, I w when I was first diagnosed, I didn't even know what, what PDD-NOS was. And so last year, somebody's like, oh, yeah, yes, you're on the spectrum. Really? <laughs> so it's it's been an eye opener, most definitely. Mm. Well, and it, it sounds to me too like it hasn't exactly changed the trajectory of your future or where you identify yourself as as a as a man as an adult. It's no. just kind of clarify uh, some things. Yes, exactly. Uh, where I've where my focus has been, it's been that way since I was a little kid. You know, I've never wanted to do anything else but art, uh, specifically acting and writing. And you know that that hasn't changed at all. You know, I'm still writing during the pandemic, and I've done a couple of. Uh, acting things via Zoom. And uh, yeah, no, it just, it just clarifies some things for me. Well, so that's wonderful. Um, I think it's important. I did want to touch on that only because I think there's sometimes this perception of diagnosis with, with any kind of uh, neurodivergent condition or mental illness that suddenly feels like a death sentence. And I think it's important for us to express that it's, it doesn't change anything. It just allows you to have some kind of um, uh, 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 accommodations or coping mechanisms or, or things to learn that I think uh, can benefit us. I know in my experience, I share with Dan, my 20s were challenging. Mm -hmm. um, although I look back now um, in my 30s, I don't know how I would handle this, this moment in my 20s. Um, and I, so go, going back to that generational difference, uh, Dean, that you're interested in, um, even though we're in this kind of pause button, this kind of cloud of theater, uh, and, and whatever direction you want to take this, where do you think uh, this art form uh, needs to go to meet not only like the health safety, but also like, I think, inclusion and equity, um, what changes or maybe even opportunities out of us being forced out of the rooms that I know we all so desperately want to be in, mm. um, do you think you see on the horizon? 
You, you're muted, by the Thank you. <laughs> I don't know if I see it on the horizon or I hope for it, but I think a pause is not a bad thing. That uh, taking a moment to, um, instead of to just react very quickly and say, oh my God, we haven't done this, let's quickly do that. Sometimes a lot of harm can be done in very quick, well-intentioned action. So a pause could be a great opportunity to say, what are our values? What is it we're trying to do with theater? How can we better do that by including more people in our institutions, in our staff, in our casting, in our artistry? Like all of that can be part of that. But I also hope that we do it, like I think one of the things that's so amazing about the theater is it's so much about empathy. We have to step into other characters. I have to write other characters from the inside of them, not from my judgment of them. So I would hope that we also learn how to dream forward in empathetic ways that's not about kicking some people out so that we can make room for the new people, but to say, how do we all want to be part of this new theater going forward? How do we all want to grow together? How do I understand what it's like perhaps to be aging in the theater to have fought for certain things um, that were different things that made my theater life possible, but maybe that older person might have a harder time understanding a newer experience coming in. How do we talk to each other across those divides? That's what I hope for, but I feel like the world and the social media and the very quick conversations don't always allow for nuance. And what I really love about being in the room together is we have time to talk and to chat and to share why you think the way you think and why I do and, and have that. And I think that is so human and so important that we have to come back into a room together to do it. Mm -hmm. I don't think you can just solve that by like having theater on Facebook or having theater in Zoom. Like we have to be, audiences have to come back into that room and have this unique experience that we will all share this event together and then talk about it. That to me is the magic of theater. Right. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, I want to open it up to the room of uh, where you hope uh, we might have some opportunities in this in this moment of kind of strife. Um, and also, uh, uh, yeah, or like also, and actually, I think Dean makes a very good point. Sometimes well-intentioned, fast-paced change can have dire consequences. Um, and so, uh, I like let's let's be honest with like do we have any fears about when we return and we are able to invite everyone into a room together? Um, Dan, you seem to have your your nodding your head. Yeah, I mean, um, I, I I had one point I had wanted to mention earlier was on uh, on Jay's uh, comment about how um, how you, how and and you're following up all with him at um, you know getting diagnosed with. Autism does not make you different. You've always been the person you are. It just gives you a better understanding of that, you know? But uh, yeah. to go with what you were just doing with your current question, um, I mean, you know, like, like Jim said, you know, we, we had a little bit of a brief discussion before we started the recording. And I mean, I said straight out that, I mean, this medium has a lot of things that I don't like about it. I want to be in a room with people i you know i like everyone else has said it's very important as an artist to create something with other actors in a space and plus i mean once you get actually into a performance you also have to have the audience because you know if if, if you don't have an audience to, in front of you that's responding to each and everything that you're doing either positively or negatively however they feel and allow you to express yourself and alter your own acting to, to, to get responses that, that, that you feel they should be giving or that you want them to give, that, that you, you want it to be natural, you know? And without the audience there, it makes things so tough, really. Right. I mean, it's just, yeah. Even now, I, want to, a I want to get back, I want to get back into doing that. But again, I mean, we have a pandemic going on, you know, it's like, we don't want to hurt ourselves. We don't want to hurt others. So right now, this format is kind of what we have to do just for our own safety and that of the audiences. But we want very much for this to end so that we can have real live performances with audiences again, you know? 
Um, and actually, this brings up a good point is I think there's often a, a misunderstanding or stigma of, you know, someone with autism doesn't want to be touched, doesn't want to be near people, doesn't want to make eye contact. Uh, and as we've all learned that if you've met one person with autism, you've met one yeah. person with autism. Um, uh, particularly with my neurodivergent three fellows here, uh, mm -hmm. but Jim and, and Dean still feel free to chime in. Uh, like, you know, uh, are, beyond the artistic immediate challenges, you know, what challenges are you facing in isolation? Um, you know, I, I think, you know, loneliness, what have you. Yeah. Constant memory flashbacks from previous points in time that some are good, some are bad, and it just overwhelms you because I mean, you're stuck in the four walls of your apartment and you have nothing to do but think about everything in existence. Well, and actually, and David, you were, you were touching on that, that you've been writing a lot more, you think, possibly, because you're, you're even just communicating with yourself a bit more. You're, you're talking to yourself. Um, are there other means that you've also you've been doing to try to keep yourself, keep, keep your brain inside your skull, if you will? Oh, yeah. I mean, I'm, 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 fortunate, I'm fortunate that I you know, have, have a bicycle a little bit near the bike path and, and you know, this, I can, this, this beautiful scenery. So I have an advantage over people I know who live in New York City. Uh, just, just really, it's a matter, a matter of discipline. Just saying, okay, when, when the cloud finally lifts, I want to be prepared to start diving in. I want to be so just trying to keep myself healthy stick to routine and be creative and, and pre like prepare. Now, if, I mean, I'd like to think this right now, it's not a substitute for live theater, it's a preparation for live theater, right. you know, for, that, we're, that we're, as in generating material and keeping, and keeping ourselves, and keeping ourselves as a company and as, and as artists and as people visible for yeah. work. So when, when the audience can come back safely, we have we have something to give them right away because they they want it as much as we want it. I think absolutely. So and yeah. if if there are other ways we can make make conditions better, way, ways we as individuals can affect the lifting of the cloud, such as you know like wearing a mask, a lot of, a lot of tests. I mean that's that's I mean that's that's my goal. So I I want to I want to survive this. I want to survive and I want to thrive, and I want that for all of you. Yeah, so that's my piece. We all just want ourselves to survive, both mentally and physically. We want the profession to survive as well. Uh, well put, well put. I think we wanna we wanna keep the the artistry alive. Uh, Jay, you were leaning in as though you had a you had a thought. I wanted to allow you to. Press it. Um, no, I just, I like the thoughts that are being shared here as far as what David said about how this is a uh, preparation and how uh, Dan said that we want the profession to survive as well. And I just, I'm, I'm doing different things, uh, walking every day, uh, still writing. I just, uh, finished an email with my publisher about another book coming out. So, yes. you oh, got that's so exciting. Yeah, <laughs> I'm very excited about it. I've got uh, I've got actually got enough material for two books, but we're spreading them out. <laughs> so, but yeah, it just to to keep the mind fresh and and keep the things going, and you 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 can't stay. You can't stay isolated in a little bubble, you know? This allows us to see and do things that we wouldn't be able to see and do without it. Uh, I've been introduced to other writers and performers through uh, the online mediums. And so, uh, that's that's really the key is to introduce yourself to other works and that helps influence your own 
and keep mm. and again keep your mind fresh keep ingesting keep ingesting art keep on exactly yeah absolutely i think the best way to look at this medium is it, as we as we've already said it's, it's a preparation but also i think that in the future we need to look at it not as just zoom or just um you know live theater we have to kind of bridge the gap and be able to say that you know we we need both we we can start up the conversation on zoom and then transfer it to a, a live space and that way we, we already have some idea of what we're doing even before we get into a live space and that way I mean, it's like we need to use the best of both tools it's like the best of both worlds needs to come together you know and like, uh, like actually as you were saying um, um yep. right when we come back uh, it sounds like you're kind of touching on like we need to allow it's not like we're going back to theater because it also sounds like there's yep. been you know a, a lot um in the cultural yep. shift we need to address that some of that theater as it stood has some adjustments to me yeah but like it's, like, it's we like we need to grow we need to we need to evolve to use all the tools at our disposal yep Absolutely. exactly um well, this was this was an awesome discussion. I just think I wanted to close it on. We've been talking about where this medium really, um, you know, it started with the conversation about meeting that neurodiversity and aging. And it sounds like also were we in a room together, uh, the 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 process and the product might come out a bit differently. Um, and I think if we were in a room together right now on this panel, our conversation probably might might not be so focused on how we're not in a room together yeah. <laughs> um, but i do appreciate that we acknowledge that it's not just artists and actors and stage managers and directors and designers who are not in a room together and executives mm -hmm. and, and people who help with money um it's not just those people it's it's the audience and it's like we're missing an audience i know from my experience as an actor doing some zoom work i'm acting to my computer and where I feel the artistry that Dean had kind of touched on is that intangible connection between not just audience and actor, but actor and actor, words and mouth. It's the yeah. space between that we thrive on. And I know it fuels me. Um, so we are gonna continue pushing and evolving and growing and educating ourselves um, about how we can make theater in the future and how we can keep it going right now. Um, but for all of those viewing us right now, for being our- We want you to evolve too. Yeah. In other words, yep. Uh, for all of you in the audience right now who are watching us, thank you so much for being a part of-, of Definitely, yeah. Please uh, support the local artists in your local theaters, and please stay connected, stay safe, and stay tuned.